The last uh, speaker of this afternoon uh, is Lori Brocolo, uh, Transforming Loans to Landscape. Landscapes, I'm sorry. Uh, Lori uh, was a tree hogger uh, long before it became uh, cool. The law of nature is why she pursued a degree in environmental horticulture and environmental conservation in 1978. She was the first uh, recipient of the FLCC's Alumni Award, the first EPA's Environmental Leadership Award from Lawn and Landscape Magazine in 1989, and the first to be recognized in the Excellent in IPM Award that is given by, uh, presented by our program. Lori started the Brocolo Tree and Lawn Care Business in 1990 and has proudly through many people for careers in the green industry. The company sets the standards for implementing environmental initiatives in home and commercial landscapes from burning gardens to green, roof, green roofs. She will share with you insights for installations and maintenance that fail and how to succeed in turning loans into natural landscapes. Thank you all for being with us today. I don't know about you, but I've been <laughs> trying to digest so much information and taking a lot of notes. It's been a great day. I've learned a lot from the presenters and also the interaction during the breaks. This is fascinating. So my goal is just to share with you some of the experiences. Um, I'd love to tell stories about every one of them, but I can't <laughs> again with our time frame. Let's see if I go the right way. Is it this way? Nope, I went the wrong way. How do you like that? Hi. Which one? Okay. The one to the right? Yep. There you go. Okay. All right. So um, ever since we started the business, it's always been with an environmental approach. And um, I'm going to start to show you just some of the projects that we've worked on. And this is my own home way back when we started um, just adding a whole bunch of native plants. And I wanted to create a little park-like scenario in our suburban neighborhood, which was full of a lot of kids and lots of desert lawns. And if you were a bird flying over, you would definitely want to go to this one little tiny property and hang out there. And so did all the kids in the neighborhood with the climbing trees. It was so much fun. So it actually became newsworthy. Wait, <laughs> So that is me, yes, and um, I've always been into the environment, and I decided to try clover and English daisies and see how that would work out. So here's a picture of the property a few years later with um, clover lawn, mm -hmm. and what was great was when I sold the property, the next owner um, was a good friend and really kept all of the gardens um, in place for several years as well. This was on a lot of backyard habitat tours, a Genesee Land Trust does those tours. And what amazed me is how disconnected people really are from nature. Coming here, one of the best plants that people would get excited about, took tons of photos of, was a milkweed. It was strategically, it grew there. I'd weed out other milkweeds, but this particular one was in a perfect spot. It was very architecturally gorgeous. And, people, and it was in bloom. And people wanted to know where I got this exotic plant. So I'm like, wow, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> so, I don't know if you've all met Michael Warren Thomas, but he's back here and he's been on the news talking about his Rochester property in which he converted to all um, plants and no lawns at all. And it was, um, it's, it's a great article. And what was interesting to me was all the different comments, though, online of, well, you know, mowing is so much easier, uh, meadows bring mosquitoes, you know, and rodents and snakes. And what was really surprising to me, though, was how controversial some of the comments got. It was absolutely sh shocking on shaming of lawns. Now they're trying to shame us, those liberals. <laughs> um, and things like, um, I don't want a hippie lawn in my neighborhood. It was um, it just reminded me of how carefully we need to talk to others. We are all, you know, we, we're already convinced. So how do we influence other people into reducing their lawns? And that's something that I think I've been able to do. Our company has been able to do because we take care of lawns. 
So we um, fertilize lawns and spot treat IPM approach. So what was interesting too is as we've been developing some of these designs and converting lawns, parts of lawns, is what is really important and what was the concern? How many neighbors complaints there have been? We had to go to several different town uh, public hearings in Henrietta, the town of Henrietta, uh, Brighton. It's just um, really interesting. And then you get this public input and a lot of anger really about ruining what? Their property values. It really had nothing to do with the nature and how things looked. It was all about their property values are gonna go down. Um, so understanding that and trying to create this typical neighborhood, a lot of those are my customers. They have nice lawn. We only spot treated the weeds, just so you know. <laughs> but um, how do we convert them? And as I was driving through this particular neighborhood, I was really surprised to see this one slope, this one backyard was let go. Now, to most of the neighbors, I'm sure that was completely unkept and unacceptable. And I looked at it thinking, wow, why are those other neighbors mowing everything away? <laughs> so it, we don't have to be convinced. And this is a perfect example though, of getting kids out closer to nature in their backyards. What is the most motivating factor for reducing lawns? This has been really exciting for me, especially in the garden center, that we have people coming in demanding natives where three, four years ago, just a few people, a few educated people now, younger people are coming in with their parents and insisting that we get natives and that we save the bees. So it really is that whole message, save the bees, the pollinators is resonating with people and they wanna do their part. I say, I love to uh, take care of people's lawns and then convince them, how can we reduce it? And, <laughs> There's acres and acres of lawns that are mowed, and I just wonder why. And perfect example is we try to get someone to stop mowing a third of the lawn. Let's just do a little bit at a time. Stop mowing it. Can we plant some wildflowers? But what's really important is the design and making sure that we have mowed buffers, that we have some delineation of, you know, like this with the, the boulder wall. But there's got to be a way for people to see the transition. And this is a gorgeous property that was surrounded by nature, and yet they were mowing um, way too much. So I love that we could have these conversations, and the client wanted to try it. So, and they don't always work out, by the way. Wildflowers are not that easy to get established. So I want to talk about what is the easiest transition for getting people to stop mowing. And it's finding the site that doesn't make sense to mow, like this example, homeowners association, this entire slope all the way around the entire property was being mowed. And we were able to convince them to just stop mowing it. Well, what about the weeds? You know, cause you got a board of directors and now they're concerned about the weeds. So we actually did have to go in and spot treat once a year so that we kept the burdock and the teasel and the thistles and the golden red, the things I all love um, under control so that people would at least accept the fact that it was a little bit more symmetrical and it, um, it, it, it was much more accepting. And then I look at their lawn and their lawn looks horrible anyway in the summer. So <laughs> what is the point of that lawn? And I, when, you, when you see that contrast, the fact that that's alive and you go for a walk and you see and hear the birds and people start to get connected to nature. COVID really did that for us, I think. A lot of people found out that they liked the nature in their backyards. We get tons of questions to seed the shady lawns. Constantly, people wanna grow grass where it doesn't grow. And this particular person was constantly raking up all those beautiful pine needles and putting seed in every single year, spring and fall fertilizing and getting really frustrated. So I said, stop, <laughs> just leave it alone, right? Let's use those pine needles and create a nice little sanctuary. It's a park in their backyard. And then it's amazing how the stress will go away because when you're obsessing over lawns and you see these bad spots, you feel compelled to have to get out there and fix it. Well, we fixed it. They didn't have a lawn to worry about anymore. How great that was. And they really enjoyed it. 
this is my sister's uh, property in Florida. So I just like the same principles are no matter wherever you are. When she first was there and all these beautiful oak trees, she was raking the oak leaves away and actually bagging them. Then as she started planting, I was able to convince her to stop taking the oak leaves away and actually rake the oak leaves off the lawn areas and then spread it through. Now she steals the neighbor's bags of leaves. It's <laughs> really hysterical. And that place is filled in. This is a bird sanctuary. I just love going to visit there. When people insist that they can get grass to grow or they used to have grass there, I had grass there a couple of years ago. Why can't I get it now? And I get frustrated. So I just tell them, go take a hike. Literally, <laughs> take a hike in the woods and see that grass does not grow there anymore. People are really disconnected from nature. I like this one. It's one of my favorite cartoons. Can everybody read that? <laughs> okay. So, yeah. That's what I say. Styles of um, design. This one is extremely tidy and the client at this property, we did the maintenance for them, but there was never any grass planted. So I thought, oh, that's great that they started with that concept because it was way too hilly and too shady, but they put in um, you know, all these different ground covers. Unfortunately, years ago, most people didn't know there was a lot of other ground covers that they could even choose from, or they couldn't even get them because a lot of native plants weren't available. But that does take a lot of maintenance time and keeping that pruned and neat so it actually looks like, you know, the ivy's not taking over. If you let it go, it would just completely cover everything. But this is my style. And the customers that I typically work with are ones that allow a little bit of organized chaos. They like a naturalized look and yarrow and that. So this is one of my favorite little gardens because it's still existing. And it's all annuals. We talked about annuals and perennials and they're not native. Well, actually I believe the poppy is native. And then you have the Dane's rocket that everybody thinks is flocks out on the sides of the roads. And then forget-me-nots, but it all completely dies off in the summer. Yet it's one of the earliest spring flowering, pollinating activity sections in the garden. And then we can add some cosmos or some other things that look kind of native, zinnias or whatever for the monarchs and other butterflies. This, this is a customer that I am so proud of. <laughs> and... Um, we've done a couple of articles with her. She decided she wanted to just have a monarch haven. It's her duty to help save the monarchs. And she wanted a milkweed garden. So she stopped mowing and spread a lot of seeds, common milkweed seed. It was coming along. And then she got complaints from the neighbor. And she lives in Pittsburgh, if you know Pittsburgh. So she couldn't do it in her backyard because she doesn't have a backyard. So she only had the front. But then she started mowing just the path around the edge, which actually gives her a lot of access. She hired us to bring in another couple of hundred perennials for pollinators and things like that. But she was very smart and adamant that she was gonna teach her neighbors by having the certified wildlife habitat right at the entrance, people when walking by, they see that and they're like, oh, there is a purpose. So she is educating people without really going out and doing it herself. Homeowners, those homeowners associations. <laughs> I refuse to work with them anymore. Sometimes we have other people in our company that can handle that. But this was a fun project because the maintenance guys had, see, see the swamp on the left, right? And we have this beautiful pool and then they had grass in between. Well, it was always so wet. And so all of the homeowners were complaining to the maintenance guys, you never get it mowed. They'd finally be able to get it mowed. Otherwise they'd get it stuck and they'd mow it in July when it would dry up. And then it looked like a hay field. Then they get complaints about that. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, let's just get rid of it and try some wildflowers. And yes, there's a lot of uh, annuals, cosmos in that. They got so many compliments that year that there was beautiful birds, flowers, butterflies, and the attitude completely changed. Just such a simple, simple solution. Yes, they have to keep doing the annuals every year to get the kind of color that people need or want. There's a perception of wildflowers 
and that once you put in a wildflower meadow that it's going to stay like that because again people don't understand the succession and, and some of the maintenance to keep a meadow this particular customer actually added um annuals every year too this is northeast wildflower mix from um, american meadows very common and um and it it really did a, a great job but um and this customer knew that there was going to be succession and there'd be some maintenance and after the second year it was interesting though to see what comes back the dames rocket and the daisies were absolutely gorgeous the following spring or two springs later and then it transitions into coriapsis in the fall um when you try to do a property like this in a commercial business commercial properties they they expect it to look like that first slide and there's a lot of education that we have to do with developers and things like that frito lay one of the first lead certified businesses um, in henrietta did wildflowers and they didn't get a lot of really healthy wildflowers the seeding uh wasn't put in per specs plus most construction people don't understand how to even spread wildflower seed but they did they got some galardia and just the grasses i thought it looked absolutely beautiful especially when you compare it to the next door neighbor and they again just have a, a boring lawn but maintenance was getting out of control and they didn't know what to do with it it's pretty simple we go in a couple times a year and weed whack anything that's too tall it, and then you have beautiful um you, you can see actually even some of the blue flex on, that was in that seed mix and all so it's not that hard there is maintenance but it's not that difficult this property rivers run is in henrietta on genesee river near rit and the developer here had this um typical landscape architect drawing that was approved but he really wanted this to be a gorgeous uh, uh, community of environment and so we had to go back to the town and uh, what we did was explain to them that those monocultures of trees everywhere was definitely not um, good for the environment and we wanted to create groupings of trees instead so as long as we had the same amount of trees and shrubs they were okay with it but it took a, a couple of months of really going through and having the conversation with the planning boards and then the yellow areas are what we just called no mow lawn area so uh creeping sheep fescue mix and then the pink areas around the ponds was all wildflowers and it really I'm, I'm quite proud of it it came in very nicely and what's interesting for the developer is he saved a ton of money but all he got to talk about was how he was saving the environment and he attracted really interesting people to buy those condominiums and this is the transition over the years and um they they have actually kept up with it pretty good some areas they've had to do some reseeding I don't remember the date, but it's probably 15 years at least. So it's, I think, one of the most successful ones. Then you get complaints about that. Look at how awful it looks, right? Because people don't understand. Again, you know, we want to leave all of that there for the winter for the birds. So some residents totally appreciated it. And they actually had clubs that went around and took pictures of the birds and actually documented. So, um, but maintenance. So it has to be cut down in the spring before anything really starts growing. Otherwise, it, I would just leave it. <laughs> but again, we're trying to work with the perception of people and help them understand. This is, we've done so many seedings, wildflower seedings. We, we call that the wildflower dance where we measure the area actually and very precisely have um, the seed mixed in with sand so if it's like one half a pound per thousand square feet imagine that's that's just barely in my hand right how are you going to distribute that so we mix it very carefully we have like a recipe layers of sand and a little bit of seed and then we measure it and we know that um 
two thirds of a bucket will cover 2000 square feet. So we've got it down to a science of distributing it. And this is that same property just at the following fall. I'm just gonna go through this pretty quickly. You know, things that, complaints that we hear about, and that's where I think you all can help influence, you know, the mowing maintenance. Well, it's less labor, especially in municipalities and larger properties that have way too much lawn. Habitat loss, well, obviously that's an issue. So let's take care of it. We can do that. Save the bees, we plant some pollinator plants. Noise pollution, we haven't talked about that very much at all. And that is a serious issue, in my personal opinion. I cannot stand to listen to mowers constantly. So less equipment, climate change, less fuel, less fertilizers, et cetera. This property is just uh, two years ago. She moved in from Seattle and said, I don't want any lawn in the back. It's a real thing in Seattle. People get rid of lawns. But here in Rochester, it was very conservative. I was so thrilled to be able to work with her because we transitioned it from lawn to this little park-like area. That's my kind of sketch, just so you know. Um, if you're going to pay me for a design, <laughs> you're not going to get. I will just kind of sketch out an idea. But mainly what I'm looking for on any of the designs is that we have pathways that go through to get people out into their yard and walking through. And so here it was in the fall. And then here it is just a couple of weeks ago. So I spent two years. And what I love is that her son, who is a college kid, this is his favorite place. He actually is in charge of the weeding. And a lot of those things are actually weeds. We didn't plant them, but they look great. They flower, they're the right size. They're not intrusive. So just having a better understanding of the look, that naturalized look doesn't have to be uh, specific plants neatly groomed. Front property, again, pathways, you know, through the garden so the customer can walk through. Oh, and that Menarda, you know, I hear from people all the time at the garden center, Menarda, obedient plant, those are invasive plants. And I'm like, no, they're aggressive. We like assertive aggressive plants because they help crowd out the weeds, okay? They're not invasive unless they don't ever belong here. And it's so much easier to maintain. So when they do get a few weeds popping in there, she gets a lot of uh, nut sedge. I'm like, the nut sedge looks great in there, leave it alone. And survival of the fittest, that's my theory. How am I doing on time? Am I doing good? What's I worry about? Okay, good. So I only just have a couple of more things to show you, but this is another project that it, we have done and maintained over the years, trying to keep that um, maintained up on that hill, wildflowers. This is an example in Fairport on Main Road where a lot of people got to see this transition into a beautiful front yard shade garden, very inviting. This one was quite controversial. This happened last year. We were hired by a customer to get rid of the front lawn and transition it into, you know, some gardens. So we got pretty far. We got the pathway in lawn and we got a stop work order from the city of Rochester. We were in violation of some city code because it's a historic district and we didn't get approval and lawns are the traditional historic opinion of people in that neighborhood. They wanted lawn. So we had to go to the public hearing, it took a couple of months. Oh, it was so frustrating and embarrassing, but we came away from it with um, you know, design. The only thing on their property that was gonna be lawn was just a little patch in the back for the dogs and everything else was going to be gardens. And the pathway was really a important piece of it. What I had to do is dig up photos of like Elwinger Gardens and some of the other historic gardens from that area and show them that historically people planted gardens, edible gardens. They didn't plant lawns. That was something that came up in the 1920s or whatever. And these homes are from the mid 18, uh, 1800s. So um, I think show them a perspective. We, we did a lot of work. Anyway, they finally approved it. And what I loved was when the chairman said, this could be a great example for everybody in the neighborhood. 
and approved it. Wow. So I felt really great success there. And so that was last fall that we put the plants in and this is what it looked like a couple of weeks ago. It's not filled in yet because our goal is aggressive plants. So she doesn't have to have a lot of weeding. And this is our property in Penfield. So I hope that someday you'll come out and visit us. And the garden center is to me, it's a lot of fun because I create little gardens and examples everywhere. And then we have the farm that we have wildflower meadows and that barn we restored several years ago. It's a 1900 barn. And every weekend we have workshops there. And we also host a lot of uh, programs. So if people want to have a program there, garden club programs, that kind of thing, that's what we love to do. We love to share the property. And I feel like with what we're doing, and this validates by just being here that, you know, the little bit of stuff that Brocolo has done over the years that we're actually are making an impact. And we all know that everybody just does their little part can make an impact as well. And here's some resources. Uh, American Beauties is one of my favorite vendors because they are growing and propagating natives only. Ohio Prairie Nursery Seed is my favorite seed vendor because they work with a lot of natives and they're not trying to sell a ton of in, um, annuals and things like that. They really have multiple uh, environmental seed mixes for wetlands, rain gardens, dry, whatever. Um, so you just go on their website. And Doug Ptolemy, we already talked about him a little bit earlier today, homegrown national park. Let's get our backyards on the map and um, just and certified wildlife habitat. I mean, there's just so much info out there. And now all the information that Ashley put up there, like, oh my God, they got all these websites to go to for Cornell and start sharing with everybody as well. So that's it. We have time for some questions for Laurie. Ashley. You gotta use the mic. And I'm gonna use it. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm gonna while well, well, Ashley's getting a mic. Um, I have one from online. Okay. It says, oops. Um, do you suggest planting these perennial spice or corn gallon? Just go off. Okay. So every property is different and it depends on your patience as well. Um, the slopes, when we do wildflower seedings, we have to add a tectifier, like a mulch to help hold it in place. And um, when we're converting lawn areas, usually what we'll do is mix in some one gallon containers We'll mix in some seed and we'll also do flats of little three inch, four inch sizes. And that way they can see it in stages and it starts to fill in a lot better because the expense is also a big issue. I mean, if we just did all one gallon containers or three gallon containers, then it would be really costly. So we try to balance the budget and the goal. Um, I had a question about when you work, have you worked with any municipalities that actually have um, ordinances on the books that actually promote? The Is there any municipalities that promote this right. concept? I'm going to say to encourage it. Yes. Yeah. Um, when I worked with the town of Henrietta on some of the changes there, I don't know that they've come out with it yet, but their town engineer was um, came on board after the others that refused to change. Anyway, he um, he invited a lot of us in to help review all of their town specs and actually change the specs from monoculture trees and like that. So I'm not quite sure if it's already been published, but I was thrilled to see that. Yeah, they were they were on the same page. Awesome. When you were spot treating for weeds, uh, what were you, you know, which weeds were you targeting since other weeds were acceptable? 
when I first started the business in 1990, and I've been in this business longer than that. I worked for Ted Collins for 13 years and I started his lawn care. I really got to uh, practice on his money. <laughs> he was a wonderful coach. And, um, but we would spot treat all of the weeds because at that time, people were just completely, you know, unaccepting of any weeds. And we used more insect control than I would have liked. But then within, that was in the 70s. By the time I started my business in 1990, I refused customers that insisted on grub control, for example. They just wanted it just for the heck of it. Um, or if they wanted blanket treating, I refused to do that. They would um, put up with spot treating if they wanted to stick with us. And primarily the dandelions and the plantain, the bigger weeds that really annoy people. Over the years, people wanted their clover gone because they didn't like the bees in their yard. Now, I, it's amazing though. Now we ask customers, are you okay with the clover? Oh, absolutely. Now we have customers asking us to introduce clover into their lawns. So what a difference it's been in 33 years of my business. Yay, tree hogging's in. <laughs> Thank you so much.